Hello and welcome to my talk DevSecOps up and running with JFrog X-Ray. My name is Sven Ruppert and I'm developer advocate at JFrog. What do we want to do today is we want to see first the difference between DevOps and DevSecOps just to have an idea where are the pain points and what you should avoid. After this I will have a few minutes about why DevSecOps will minimize uh, the risk in your projects and for your business. And after this, we will have a view like a developer. So what the developer will see in daily life. And after this, we will have a few points about the architecture and what you can do here. And the last one will be how to integrate all this in existing infrastructure. Difference between DevOps and DevSecOps. If you're looking at the internet, especially for Wikipedia, you will see that DevOps is a well-defined thing. It's more or less, um, yeah, a lot of books are uh, written about it and um, sometimes you have different opinions what is part of it, but in the end, there are some key points part of pure DevOps. It means we are looking at the process from coding over building and testing a software up to packaging, releasing, and then later running. So it's a configuration and monitoring of the uh, productive systems. So if you're looking at this one, you see that it's purely focused on the development itself. So it's a more or less generic thing. So um, there is no uh, special part for performance. There's no special part about um, quality and there is no dedicated part of security. So what does it mean? If you're looking a little bit to the history of DevSecOps or where DevSecOps or DevOps is coming from, you will see that mostly in companies you have this situation that you have this Dev part and the Ops part. The Dev part was mainly focused on uh, the coding part, building and testing. And after all this is done, you had something like a repository, maybe Artifactory, and there was this packaged thing that the Ops team could grab, configure, test, deploy, whatever they want to do with it. So this is not good because you have two dedicated teams or there is a big border between this. So it makes sense to make this more or less transparent so that you have not the dev part and the ops part. And it means that everybody should be aware of all these things. If you're looking at this one, the first question is where is the right place for security itself? Do we have to add one dedicated point in this pipeline for security testing? Maybe you are asking if security is just a product you can buy. Or will security mean that I'm slow in production because I have to do more things now? One more item in my pipeline. So all this, if, if you're just looking at security itself and define security as one place in your pipeline, then it's not really optimal for your process and business. So to give an answer to, to a few of these questions, so security is tested after, for example, performance or after whatever. No, security is not one dedicated step in your pipeline that you should focus on. Security is something that should be everywhere. It makes no sense just to hire someone with a security background and he's ignoring the rest of the team or the team is ignoring him or whatever you want to have. So it's not just hiring one guy that is now responsible for security and that's it. So security is more, it's, it's something for the team itself. And if you're thinking about what a developer should feel, it's definitely wrong if he ha will have the feeling that security is just bringing tight borders around him. It's, it's not losing control. Security is something that it will be integrated and security, security is something that maybe will give you more freedom than you had before because you can make decisions faster and easier because you know what is coming. So DevSecOps is more like a culture. It's something you will see keywords like security first, for example, or zero trust environments or whatever. So security is more or DevSecOps is something like a philosophy, something like 
performance, something like quality. Quality is nothing that is just bound to one tiny step. Quality is something that is everywhere in your pipeline. It means from the first beginning of your production, you have quality in your mind with every single step you're doing. The same with security. If you're going to security, right now from the first line of code, security should be one part you have an eye on. That means security must be introduced as early as possible. So not only after everything is coded and use cases are done, it makes sense to introduce security right now from the first line of code. I will show you how this could look like for you. So it means security is part of the whole life cycle. It's not a dedicated step. It's going from the first line of code, as I mentioned before, up to monitoring, deploying, productive systems. So every tiny step will have some security things, attributes, stuff you could do, and even thinking about testing. So just thinking about testing functionality is one thing, but if you have security in mind, even during your TDD phase, you could have something like risky payload testing and all this stuff. So security should be everywhere. Why DevSecOps will minimize your risk or the risk for your business? That is a good question. So why you should do it? Having in mind that a lot of stuff is based on open source. In the Java world, you're speaking about 60 up to whatever percentage. So a lot of stuff in your product or project will be a dependency, will be coded from someone else, will be maintained by other people. This makes sense because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to code all this stuff by yourself because then you need all the knowledge in your house. This is maybe not a good idea. And the best thing or the other thing is you should focus just on your use cases to bring the best quality to your customers. But at the same time, you must trust. You must trust other people's implementations and how to do this one. So you have security things and you have compliance. So both must be available, the information about it. So open source is good because you can analyze it easily and fast. Everything is accessible. With closed source, it's mostly a little bit more tricky because you have to do all this stuff indirectly. So security issues are quite often found early in open source. Well, I have no numbers about this, but it's easier to detect them, for sure. Another thing, as I mentioned, is compliance. Open source means you have a big bunch of different licenses. Different licenses means that some of these licenses are good for your business and some licenses are just poison. So sometimes it's a really bad idea if you just trust the uh, license that this project is giving you or declaring maybe some transitive dependencies are just not the same license or as license that really fits to your business. So you have to check all transitive dependencies as well, if they are using the right license and if they are declared right. So make sure that you have a full overview about all stuff that is part of your project or business. DevSecOps or DevOps in general means that you have to speed up your production in terms of automate as much as possible. If you have a CI pipeline, this is a way to go to make as much as possible in the CI pipeline because this is doing stuff again and again with the same quality and you can just increase speed with automating things. The next thing is, it's good for security and for quality if you are removing all boring parts from your production because with this, people are more focused on the tasks that are really important. And this means you can increase quality and security. So not only bugs, but even compliance and security issues should be killed as soon as possible in your project. Okay, what the deaf will see. What the deaf will see, have in mind that, for example, you have a new feature, a new use case, whatever you want to integrate in your product or your project. Means that you have some ideas and you will start with a fresh, tiny project, a side project, just declaring a few dependencies and start coding. 
this can take a few hours, a few days, maybe longer. If you have done all this and the proof of concept is perfect and you decide this feature is really worth to have in your product, it would be suboptimal if at this point you will start analyzing dependencies and you find out that the dependencies or the, the implementations you are using not fitting to your project in terms of security or compliance. Mean, meaning that, or this means that even if you're starting a tiny new project, adding the first dependency, you should have an overview if everything is green for you. Or at least that you know what is there. For example, you know that you're using a dependency that you have to change because you have to discuss about the license. So this is a good thing if you have all this one and the JFrog X-Ray plugin will exactly give you the possibility to have this information right now from the first line of code and to check security and license issues. So what I want to show you now is how to use X-Ray IDE plugin for IntelliJ and what you can see there. Okay, next is the integration inside the IDE. Um, I'm using here IntelliJ, but uh, we have plugins for different other IDEs, for example, Eclipse or VS Code. So um, have a look at the web page and see what version and plugin is available for your IDE. Here for this one, I have to install this plugin. Uh, it means I'm going to the plugins marketplace searching for jfrog and I will find the jfrog plugin. In my case it's already downloaded and installed um, because I'm using it uh, already. So after you install this plugin you have the configuration page uh, in IntelliJ it's under other settings jfrog x-ray configuration. Here you can add the URL, the username and password and check if you have a connection to your instance. In my case, it's an X-ray version 3.2.6 and that's it. Now it's available. The functionality is available inside your ID. For this demo, I'm using a Maven, a very easy and uh, small Maven uh, project. The typical workflow is you start adding a dependency. After this, it depends on your IDE, you have to or your configuration, uh, you have to trigger a reload of this, um, a reload of the definition. Um, some some people have it activated on default and auto reload. Um, I I just uh, do it manually. Um, so now the IDE knows I have this dependency comes collections with version three point two, and then I can go to my plugin. Here I have the license info selected, so I see our oh, comms collection. This version is running under Apache license. And I can have a look at the security issues as well. So if this is not available, you can just say sometimes reload, sometimes it's already loaded, sometimes you are doing it manually. And then you can see here the comms collections. <coughs> there are right now three um, security issues. And the good thing is you can see here as well if there is a fixed version available for every security issue you have. After this you can decide if you want to have this fixed with an up or downgrade of the version number or if you are fixing transitive dependencies. For example, I have something with transitive dependencies. Let's see how fast it's today with my internet connection. So I'm Selecting just another dependency from a little bit bigger uh, project. I have my Maven reload. This performs just uh, depending on the internet connection you have. And um, my one is not the best, so it will take a few seconds to get this information. The ID was able to load all dependencies. You have the new dependency tree here. It could happen that sometimes you have to say, OK, please ask JFrog now for this uh, new dependency tree you have in your project. It will connect to the X-Ray instance. And again, it depends a little bit on the internet connection you have. Then you will see here the component tree, the dependency. Here it's Vardin. 
And if you're clicking inside, you can now navigate through the transitive dependencies, green, red or orange for the different uh, levels. And if you check here, for example, the Vardy charts with this uh, version is consuming or has a transitive dependency to Jackson Core, uh, the Jackson data bind in this version. And the transitive dependencies from Jackson data bind, they are green, so here is no issue. But the Jackson data bind itself has some issues. Here you have the information what is uh, inside and the good thing is again you see if there are some fixed versions already here for example for this one we don't have a fixed version until now so now it's up to you to decide if you want to um, override the transitive dependencies if you want to exclude charts because you are not using it or if you're going to a different Vardian version itself so really this is project depending but uh, the whole thing is you have the possibility to navigate the whole dependency tree. That's it. So even if you're just adding a dependency to your project, the good thing is that you are informed immediately if you have some compliance or some uh, security issues. So that's it with the ID integration. Okay, after we saw now what's possible in the IDE and how this will looks like for a developer. The next thing is that I want to talk a little bit about the architecture, how to integrate all this stuff. For example, if you have this um, artifactory as first barrier to the internet and everything will be stored and loaded over artifactory, for example, all Maven dependencies, you have the possibility that X-Ray is just scanning all this content and will give you the possibility to break builds and all this stuff. Everything you can do here is accessible via a REST API as well as a web UI or REST API and web UI. That means everything together is the unified platform with all parts of the JFRO product and you can go via REST to all functionalities as well as via the web UI. So it means you have their repository, you will start adding rules to make sure that all your compliance and security issues and behaviors and all this stuff is declared. You will create policies and if you have policies, you can connect this one to the resources that should be checked. It could be a Maven uh, dependency uh, repository, it could be a Docker repository, whatever. We are, yeah, we are supporting a huge amount of different repositories. So, yeah. as next, I want to show you how you can declare, for example, a rule and a policy and connect this with a watch to a resource so that you have an overview how fast this could be done and what kind of information you will get out of this dependency tree. Um, yeah, this one. And have in mind, everything is available, what I'm sharing next, via the web UI as well as the REST API. Okay, let's have a look at the JFrog platform X-Ray installation. Um, this is here my, my software as a service uh, instance, but you can have the same as um, this one on on prem. Um, if you want to try out what I'm showing here right now, um, I will give you the link for the trials a little bit later, so you can ramp up a trial. It will take approximately ten minutes or so, and then you have a whole platform installation. Um, on a cloud or in a cloud and then you can try all this by yourself so if you have your platform log in and go to the point menu point security and compliance here we'll have two different menu entries you have to start with policies because policies are used inside watches a policy is a stateless um, definition what should happen if you find something De um, depending on your definitions. I will create now a new policy. You have to define a logical name for this. Say policy minus demo. Um, if you have to deal with a lot of policies, just think about a naming schema so that this is um, scaling over the time. Um, first of all, you have to decide if it is something from the area security or license or compliance issues. I will select security. 
you can add a description but have in mind that this description uh, must be in sync with all changes uh, you are doing over the time so i personally just leave it blank here right now a policy uh, is a um, composition of rules and rules is a fine grained thing here exactly the same like um, a few seconds before you need a logical name then you can choose what's a, a pre um, you can dis, um, use some predefined levels or you can define the cvss score by yourself i just say grab everything and now you know um, how sensitive this should be this rule and the next thing is you have to um, define what is the action that should should be triggered or uh, the thing that should happen so generate va violation sorry for this generate violation is just a um, thing or it's just the entry in the web ui we'll show you in a few minutes but you can trigger webhooks to integrate with third-party programs or other infrastructure components you can notify the platform user itself or external ones as well via email if you want you can block downloads so x-ray is always connected to an artifactory and if you want to make sure that infected uh, or affected components are not even inside your repositories you can just say he block download um, if something is unscanned if you want to block yes no the same for release bundles and the most common thing is failing a build. Yes, I know. This can be used from pipelines and Team City and Jenkins, whatever CI you're using. I'm just generating the violation. Now I have this rule inside my policy and I can just create it now. The next step is creating a watch. Creating a watch means that you are connecting uh, the policies uh, or a policy you created before with the resources you want to have a look at. So I will say new watch, it's the same here, a logical name, watch demo. And now you have to decide uh, what are the resources you want to look at. I'm just selecting a few um, repositories I have here for example I have my docker you can filter here for example I have my bin tray my docker remote and that's it so these two repositories are now scanned that means this watch is connected to this repository and now I have to say what should happen I'm just selecting the policies I want to have combined here the policy demo is now associated with this watch and I can create everything after this is done you have this overview here in this mini paint watches and you can see what are the connected resources and you can um, calculate the amount of violations here you will have zero because I just created this watch and there was no um, trigger to recalculate everything because there was no change uh, not inside the repository nor build, uh, build was triggered nothing but you can trigger it manually uh, for example just have a look at the last 90 days or whatever you want to define and then it will start calculate this one it will take a few seconds but i have prepared here something a little bit earlier this one Oh, let's go back so if I'm going here to calculate you will see here you have this 400 and something violations you can have a detailed list you can filter this list if you want you have this one and then you can just grab one of these uh, items you want to have a look at uh, you see this um, small text snip that will give you a short information you see what's the uh, level uh, the classification level of this security issue and what is the resource we uh, found it in what is the component here it's a Debian Buster um, docker image 
and it's used in my created Docker image that is based on this component or it's containing this component Debian Buster. If you're clicking here, you will see the impact graph. So it's inside the Debian Buster IP tables binary inside this Docker layer inside my image. So uh, some additional information is here. The good thing is all of this is available via REST as well. It means if you want to have this information for your reporting system or whatever you want to do with this, or you want to trigger some external um, other infrastructure parts, you can uh, do with this via REST. You can consume this information or you can just trigger a webhook. So this is a web UI and the core functionality of X-Ray. Okay, we saw now how to use um, Artifactory and X-Ray in combination um, via the web UI. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the power of integration because this is a really big topic. Mostly, I assume that you will have some kind of existing um, infrastructure and how to integrate this one inside your existing infrastructure if you have, to, for example, to deal with third-party products for compliance, for auditing and all this stuff. As I mentioned before, every information is available via REST API and you can trigger hooks, webhooks. So it means not even breaking a build is possible inside your CI pipeline, but you can notify via email or you can start with a webhook and external process and you can have third-party products grabbing all this data out of X-Ray, out of Artifactory to consume it. It could be for reporting, for compliance reportings. You can start dynamic workflows based on webhooks. All this stuff is done, so you can really integrate all this stuff. The good thing is all products are available as software as a service as well as on-prem. And the good thing is you can combine it. So you don't have to decide first if you want to have software as a service or on-prem you can even mix it up. So if you have some special requirements, you can just decide for every single component, if it is a software as a service solution, if it is hosted somewhere in the cloud, if it is um, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, whatever, or you need some parts definitely inside your own network. The best thing is if you just try it by yourself. Trying by yourself means you're going to jfrog.com platform slash free trial. This is a URL I'm showing you here right now. And then you can ramp up a whole system for you, a demo environment. It will take, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to ramp it up. Then you can try all this stuff by yourself. For example, you just um, create a tiny project after you created a trial and then you're connecting to this Maven repository, grabbing one dependency and checking what information is available about it. So just do it. I have prepared a tiny project so that you can just start a trial. After this, you can just clone this um, project, change the URL to the Maven repository, your ones, and then you can ramp everything up in below half an hour if you want. So I really recommend it because then you see the full power of this stuff. Thank you very much for this. Um, if you want to reach me, the best way is Twitter. So my Twitter handle is at Sven Rupert. Thank you very much for attending and um, well, see you.